not one but two people escaped from that research setting one of them he was listening to the sermon they, so these people were like loaded up on psilocybin some had a placebo like a, a um, I believe it was it was niacin in, in that trial, so not a very good one. But but it became very, pretty clear who was on the placebo and who wasn't because they were all interacting with each other. But these people in the basement of this chapel and like hearing this sermon on a Good Friday, um, and, you know, it's a very provocative sermon. And these were all seminary students, I should say. So it wasn't like like from some you know uh, you know faith that they were alien to. And 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 one of them became so inspired is like the sermon, you know the pastor was saying you've got to you tell the world about the man on the cross and he and this participant thought yeah like i'm and he's like how do i start he's like i need to find the president of harvard i need to tell the president of harvard about the man and so he was like they had to chase him down the streets of cambridge they had to t tackle him and inject him with thorzine Matthew Johnson from Johns Hopkins University studies the effect of drugs on the brain. And we are talking to him specifically about psychedelics because we are interested in the question of consciousness. And psychedelics seem like a perfect way to enter into that world. Yeah, so you can look at how the brain regulates its different levels of perception. We get into how reality is generated or assessed and what reality really means to a human being. And he does a lot of really foundational work on how to instrumentalize these psychedelics to productive ends, how to fight depression, addiction, uh, terminal illness. I guess you can't fight terminal illness, but how to overcome the fears and anxieties associated with terminal illness. And the results are extremely promising. So I've been wanting to talk to Dr. Johnson for a long time about this. It's, it's behind a lot of the headlines you've seen about psychedelic research uh, in a clinical setting. And this is a real treat to have him on the show today. If you like what we do, tell your friends, give us a rating, give us a thumbs up, tell us that we're doing a good job. If you've already done those things and you want to further support us, we also accept donations. We have a PayPal in the description. You can join us on our Patreon at Demystify Sci. You can probably figure out how to send us Bitcoin the people that are already doing this, to our patrons, thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. The scientific revolution starts now. It's particularly interesting to see psychedelic drug effects under double blind conditions. I mean, I remember you know, folks, you know, really out there on dextromethorphan saying, uh, oh, yeah, I see the kind of geometric visuals. I bet this is mescaline um, because it has this Mesoamerica kind of vibe to it. <laughs> you know, So there's nothing like blind conditions to kind of cut through that kind of stuff and, okay. you know, see what's really, you know, what's driving things, whether it's the, the pharmacology or, you know, other factors, your expectancies, societal expectations. Yeah, I've wondered about that a lot because you hear people when they come back from a psychedelic experience where I think especially with DMT, there's a collection of things that people are said to see. I think the machine elves are up at the higher level of the DMT experience. And I've always wondered if people's experiences are colored by what they're expecting to observe because of what people told them. They clearly are. Um now it's a it's it's more difficult to say whether someone's individual experience per se was you know influenced by expectancy you know that's that's harder to say it's sort of like saying well has you know climate change contributed to an increase in you know hurricanes it's impossible to point to any one particular weather system and say aha that was if 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 uh if the climate wasn't changing, that wouldn't have happened. Or sort of like um, the example, similar examples have been given, like someone like Barry Bonds, you know, apparently been had been using steroids. And so, you know, you can, you know, it's impossible to say whether any particular game would have been won or lost had he not been using steroids. But only a fool would look at it in an entire career and say, well, that had no effect, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, yeah, you know, like clearly placebo effects, expectancy effects play 
you know, play a huge role in shaping these experiences. But then, you know, it's it's very difficult to then determine on an individual level, of course, whether that was a, a placebo experience or not. What are some of the biggest goals in your lab right now in terms of the research that you're actively engaged in at this moment? What are the questions that you're actively pursuing? So I think that the, the biggest pursuit is, is continuing this research with using psilocybin to help people quit tobacco smoking. And so I'm close to starting a, a multi-site trial, which is funded by the U.S. government, um, to look at psilocybin under double-blind conditions with placebo control, um, uh, you know, determining, you know, at not just one, but three different universities, whether it can uh, help people, you know, quit smoking long term. So really seeing that through is, is, is extremely valuable because, you know, this is a line of research that's over a decade old, about 15 years old, and it's followed a, a promising progression, but it's, you know, it started with essentially, you know, very little resources behind it and just kind of a, a kind of a wacky out there idea. Um, but it's really progressed, you know, amazingly, uh, you know, very high quit rates in an open label pilot study. We're nearing the end of a of a comparative efficacy study, randomizing people to psilocybin versus nicotine patch for um, quitting smoking with the same sort of standard talk therapy for both groups. And right now, we're still seeing very with the majority of people having reached their one year follow up. We're seeing you know roughly double the success rates uh, a year after the quit rate. I saw something really interesting in one of your papers where you were comparing three different, I think that it was one of the earlier papers where you were studying nicotine use, and you were comparing uh, people's motivation for a nicotine-containing cigarette, a nicotine-free cigarette, and nicotine gum. And you found that there was something that wasn't just about the nicotine that was driving people towards cigarettes because they preferred the non the nicotine-free cigarette to the nicotine gum. Right. Which I, I thought that that was just such a strange finding because I'm somebody who really enjoys nicotine gum, but I don't necessarily enjoy the cigarettes. And it seemed counter, but I, we just ran into a friend who who is the exact opposite, where for him, it's literally this ritualistic process of, you know, rolling the cigarette and having the papers and being able to, you know, to wield the fire. And it really it struck me that your research was was intentional enough to be able to tease that apart. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I think across, you know, gosh, any number of substances, the, the non-pharmacological factors are clearly a part of the reinforcing profile of a substance. I mean, just, I mean, just think about for anyone who really, you know, loves coffee and just like if you were to replace it all with a, with a caffeine pill, you know, you're just probably not going to get <laughs> that, you know that the the enjoyment. I mean, the aroma, the the taste, the the behavioral process of like slowly taking it in and sort of titrating your your you know your consumption to the effect. I mean, all of these things are just. Um, I mean, they're stronger for some drugs than others, and I would say smoking is a particularly strong one because. You know, kind of at the other extreme, you might have like just a pill, you know, um, something that, I mean, sure, I mean, there's all kinds of conditioned factors, you know, condi uh, uh, you know conditioned reinforcers that can go along, say, like, you know, say someone has a, have a has an issue with some oral opioid, like, you know, Vicodins, um, which is hydrocodone. Um, you know, there's all kinds of other associations, the things you're doing while you're taking it, whatnot, but the actual process of taking it, it's like, it's not very distinctive and, you know, the effects don't kick in for a half hour. So you, you swallow a pill, it might as well be a, you know, an aspirin or ibuprofen or a vitamin C pill, it, you know, but someone like smoking is at the extreme other end. I mean, it just, it floods your, you know, I mean, one, you get this, gosh, really immediate. I mean, the effects of smoking something are on par with IV intravenous use in terms of having that really powerful, quick um, penetration of the central nervous system. So you're going to feel it very quickly. 
Um, but then to have that so closely associated in time with the with the taste, with the with the smell, um, with the act of smoking, which is just this very, you know, it's a very distinct thing. We don't do this with anything else unless you're smoking or vaping something. So it just kind of uh, has yeah yeah it, it's it's sort of optimally it's it's a it's a drug delivery system that sort of has optimized those conditioned reinforcers um but of course now i, I tell you when i published research like that i remember getting contacted by a um uh a, a, an attorney a couple of years afterwards and he was representing the the tobacco industry and um was clearly you know wanted me to testify um basically well based on this based on this research that you've done it suggests that nicotine doesn't have any effect you know (laughs) sort of like trying and i said well i'm not interested um and fyi you're if i had run out that particular study you know if you had Yes, all of these other, like the, the the flavor of the tobacco, the act of smoking are all conditioned reinforcers. However, if you were to expose someone to only that and were somehow able to keep them away from real cigarettes for, you know, the only thing they could smoke is denicotinized cigarettes, cigarettes with the nicotine taken out. Presumably, you would have, you would eventually have what's called extinction unfold. And in other words, that, that coupling of the primary reinforcer that nicotine hit with the taste and the feel etc of the smoking eventually that will decouple sort of like pavlov's dog the only reason pavlov's dog you know salivated when the metronome or the bell sounded was because it was reliably paired with the presentation of of the meat and so if you just kept it then if you kept you know ringing the metronome you know day after day week after week with no meat presentation presentation eventually extinction unfolds and so what i told him is that you know i I would tell people if i was on the stand and it wouldn't sound good for you you know like oh yeah this doesn't in any way shape or form suggest that nicotine isn't you know the primary uh you know pharmacological agent in tobacco that makes it addictive um presumably we would extinguish that if um if if we we gave the the cigarettes without nicotine with you know with sufficient number of trials so you know it, it's you know but until you get there it's like those those reinforcing those other non-pharmacological components are really powerful in shaping i mean some people just it's you know i mean they you know at the extreme like they might only have a, an issue with you know drinking you know one variety of alcohol i mean at the extreme levels when you get into to, to real physical withdrawal you know any alcohol from any source is going to do the trick but you know some people you know would have less of an issue if there was only wine available if they don't particularly care for wine you know and did you think that it's possible to harness this feature for more efficable drug delivery systems in say your psilocybin uh trials is, is there a way that this this coupling can actually be used beneficially so yeah sure so the you know this is the importance of set and setting and 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 all of those environmental factors and in terms of and yet having a positive set and setting making the person feel comfortable um you know, having the intention for this to be for therapeutic, for therapeutic, you know, reason, um, those are all really thought to be critical. Um, now, sometimes it, it it certainly happens where people just take mushrooms for fun, and sometimes they say, lo and behold, they quit smoking, or they quit using cocaine, or they quit, you know, drinking, and I've done research on, on all of these, but... I think Terrence McKenna claims that uh, no, it was Paul Stamets. Paul Stamets claims that a heroic dose of mushrooms, I think he took five grams, cured him of his cat allergy, which if you could look into that, I would I would genuinely appreciate. I think that unless it was Paul as well, I don't recall him saying that, but but I know a- Andrew Weil made that claim and he made that claim in his first book, um, I think it was 71 called The Natural Mind. Um, that and also having a super sensitivity to um, sunburn. 
mm-hmm. for a really mm-hmm. pale person. He said he just like laid out and, you know, I'm paraphrasing. I might get details screwed up, but like laid out, like tripping on acid, really strong, laid out in a hammock all day in the sun, just said, screw it. Let's see what happens. And he, like, he said, he's never had a, you know, an issue uh, of being super susceptible to sunburns ever since. So, I mean, it's intriguing stuff. Of course, you've got to take all that with a grain of salt, but that's where things start, you know? <laughs> I'd love I mean, to see I've that known, trial. Yeah, I've known enough about, you know, I've seen enough with these drugs in terms of their powerful mental effects that really anything in the psychosomatic realm, you know, I'm not going to, you know, buy into it based on a single anecdote, but I'm open. Um, I think, you know, gosh, uh, looking at allergic processes i mean which we know can certainly be modulated through psychosomatic processes um the idea that he's you know, no longer allergic to cats is just you know that's 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 really wild it's it's plausible enough that it should be you know explored the whole hypothalamic immune axis is really f- increasingly fascinating to me because when i was in college it was essentially unknown that the immune system was in direct contact with the central nervous system. I believe unknown by Western medicine is a more accurate unknown. assessment. Yeah, that's a silly way of putting it. I'm sorry. I mean, it was it was just not in the textbooks, really. Um, mm-hmm. And now this whole pituitary uh, adrenal axis is really becoming more and more important. And it it seems like it there might be some hope there that it could help us understand this concept of how setting really plays into the efficacy of certain pharmacological interventions. Yeah, yeah, I think that there's a huge potential for this. Um, and we've really only scratched the surface of of understanding the effects of of set and setting on the effects of these drugs. Um when you administer hallucinogens in the lab, what does it look like? So, so first of all, there's a lot, there's a good amount of screening involved. It's usually two, um, you know, half days or full days of, you know, filling out questionnaires, doing a physical, um, doing structured psychiatric, psychiatric interviews. Um, some of the biggies that um, kind of across the studies that, that I'll eliminate are, are, people at severe risk for heart disease, people who um, have either active psychotic disorders or show a, a good pre- identifiable predisposition um, for psychotic disorders like schizophrenia. Um, and then and then there's a substantial amount of preparation for people that, that qualify for entry. There's a substantial, um, it depends on the study, but four to eight hours of preparation that involves both um, didactics from the the session guides, the people who will be in the session with them to help them through the experience. So it involves didactics on what psilocybin is like. Well, it can be like this. It can be like that. Some people say this, some people say that, and really got to emphasize the the dark side because, you know, most people don't complain when it's like, I felt one with the universe and like everything was love. And you guys didn't warn me enough about that. Like that, (laughs) but understandably it's like on the darker side that people say, my God, you could, you could have never told me how intense and how terrifying that was. And so it's really a challenge with informed consent to, to prepare people for those effects. So there's an emphasis on really just describing this broad landscape, but then really critically more important than that sort of specific didactic, you know, sort of preparation for psilocybin is really that rapport building with those people. Just the idea that um, these are going to be the people when you are at your most vulnerable, who can literally take your hand and comfort you, reassure you that everything is going to be okay. And, you know, when, when bad trips spiral out of control, um, you know, which doesn't always happen in the wild, so to speak, but sometimes when it does happen, oftentimes it's around strangers. Someone's at a concert and they just get bugged out and they don't, (laughs) all these people, like, what are these people who are, I don't know all these people. Where are they up? Are they part of some conspiracy? Are they all out to get me? And and that's really difficult to navigate. I mean, one, because the ground truth really isn't known. It's like, yeah, probably everyone around you is cool, but <laughs> they're also strangers. It's like you really should be worried about things like holding on to your wallet or your purse or and and worried about things like sexual assault. I mean, these are 
you're in a highly vulnerable state with a, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people you don't know around. So sometimes they, then of course, you know, paramedics get involved in the police and that's just a big snowball that just makes things worse. But, you know, what, what you want to shoot for is just having this person trust so deeply. I mean, I, I've had people to tell me that, that, you know, afterwards that, oh my gosh, like when you, when you came in and reassured me, um, it just made all the difference in the world. Probably the most extreme example I've had actually wasn't with psilocybin, but was with Salvin Orne, the active agent in Salvia Divinorum. So I ran the first um, human research that showed you know, psychoactive effects of, of Salvia Divinorum, of Salvin Orne, the active principle, um, under double blind um, conditions. And we got people, we went up to about two milligrams, which is a very high dose of the stuff. People were routinely at those doses, communi- you know, subjectively communicating with entities is really out there. Um, but I remember the first participant ever, he, uh, he, I mean, he had a really tough effect and, you know, he just, you know, loosely speak, he just bugged out. He's like, what's going on? Uh, and I just, you know, I said, I guess I'll call him Bob here. I'll keep confidentiality, but you know, Bob, it's okay. It's Matt. I'm here. I'm not leaving you, dude. It's okay. You know, and I, that's probably more than I actually said. I don't recall exactly what I said, but he, he said after, and he was laying down on the couch and he says, he says, I looked up in you, at you and I was like, I knew I couldn't tell you who you were. All I knew is it was someone I trusted. I knew there was somebody that was like watching out for me. I couldn't tell you what, how I got there or what setting it situation it was, or that I was in a study at Hopkins or anything. All I knew was that like someone I trusted was there and it was okay. And I thought, Yes, that's what, that's the prototype. That's what we're shooting for. No matter what the substance is, you know, when you're just like very vulnerable, you, you trust very, very deeply that you can, you can let go. And that's at like different levels. That's at um, trusting your physical safety, like just things like, yeah, I was going to steal your purse. No one's going to like, if the place is on fire, someone's got your back, you know, um, and just things like, I think of, you know, you know, recreational or I guess better state at non-clinical use, you know, use in the wild, you know, and it's like, you know, one concern is like just, you know, these things are illegal. And so even if it's unlikely, you know, and especially when someone's loaded up, like, it's like, oh my God, what was that noise? Are the police, are the police at the door? Are the police going to come? And that's like one level of like, you can get so deep with this. It's like, well, probably not, but. It could be police, you know, like we don't know. It's like, and what if you, what if you have a really bad trip? And it's like, you have to go knock on your neighbor's house that would, you know, like and just, you know, and, and things just spiral out of, out of control. And, and I just think of that, those layers, like you want to shoot for a situation where you've kind of, you peeled through all those layers of the onion. Like, what are the things that, that, you know, is this disapproved by society you know, are the police going to get, well, this is DEA and FDA approved. This is sort of sanctioned by the tribe at large, as large as you could possibly imagine. Like the U.S. federal government has its seal of approval. This is OK. You're you're not doing anything wrong here. Um, and then like this trust with the people you're with, the trust that, oh, gosh, even though psilocybin is a really safe compound, relatively speaking, um, like, yeah, it, in case there's a medical issue, like, yeah, these people have my back. They've got a physician down the hall that can you know, come see me. I'm across the street from the ER. Like, you know, there's all of these late. And this is what you want to try to convince the person is that you're in this is situation where we've covered all of that. And you can just let go, let go, let go, let go, let go at these layers that you would normally never want to, nor should. And certainly in, in every situation, let go to that degree, you know, that you can't untether yourself from that, from the external world, like your shoes and your cell phone is in a safe in the other room <laughs> being kept safe, <laughs> you know, which kind of has two purposes. One, um, if, uh, you know, it helps to create that separation from the external world, but, you know, two, in case someone did get, guys, I'm getting out of here. Like, <laughs> screw this, you know, it's like, well, it's like, at least it, it forms some delay. It's like, well, your shoes are in the other room. You know, it's like, at least it like, you know, um, 
yeah, it's like physical, behavioral kind of barrier to that sort of escalating out of control and the person wanting, wanting to flee. Uh, so you, you're, But you're doing a lot of preliminary screening to already filter out people who this might happen to. And what yeah, can you percentage... Tell? What percentage of people that you've already filtered are having a level, uh, an experience to this level? Well, it's, this is really thorny because the screening is really thought to eliminate people that have a predisposition to these, these disorders where the person might be stabilized in a, in an ongoing fashion. So, um, kind of the individuals who, it's more urban legend and it's loosely stated, but you know, the people who tripped and never came back. I mean, that's never really the case. I mean, the, the pharmacology, you know, the drug has been metabolized, but it's it's close enough to the truth. I mean, in the sense that people that are really um, if you're tethered to reality, you know, by like a dangling thread, you know, the last thing you need is a big dose of a of a of a psychedelic. And so with someone with that predisposition for schizophrenia. Um, it, it, like a, you know, the people with that predisposition who are just lucky to be born into a, 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 a good family that watches after them, they're lucky enough to be born into a society that has decent medical care for people, even if they can't afford, they're lucky enough to, you know, be in a safe physical environment, all of these layers, like that person, gosh, even with that same genetic predisposition, hopefully, you know, this cards are stacked so that they're never going to have a full psychotic break and that they, um, you know, they're never going to be homeless and this type of thing. And of course, you know, oftentimes those things aren't the case. And it's like these destabilizing life events of, of any of a variety of, of forms can, can, can worsen that person's, you know, disease state. So, so that could be a, a really intense psychedelic experience. It could be experiencing homelessness. It could be, you know, the estrangement from a, 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 a loved one, it could be an assault, um, you know, the types of thing that a more resilient person without that predisposition would be able to move on from. It might really destabilize this person's, you know, um, psychotic disorder. So it's not that that's what's going on here in these cases. Now, that is not the same as a bad trip. Like anyone can have a bad trip, no matter how healthy you are, no matter how psychologically screened you are at a high enough dose you can have a bad trip so you know the the, the predisposition for schizophrenia that's more about are we going to be instigating a, a prolonged reaction beyond the normal time course of the normal drug reaction where the person has this kind of um this exacerbation of their of, the, of their existing disease or their predisposition the bad trip we see that in about a third of participants. And I should say, actually, I, I use the term bad trip because that's what people know. People know what that is. But in the research, I really framed this as a, a challenging experience because the really the bad thing that happens out in the wild is when it, it's it's not the fear and the anxiety. I mean, that could be very, very difficult. But the really bad thing is, you know, freaking out and doing something, mm. panicking. And it's rare and I it's difficult to convey because it has been definitely overplayed you know, certainly in the propaganda in the late 60s early 70s um but it is, but it is also true that sometimes people have fallen from heights and died just like plenty of people who are drunk or on any to intoxicating substance at a high enough level shouldn't be that surprising sometimes you get accidents and now whether the person thought they could fly or not or whether it was just an accident that's more difficult to judge but the nature of these reactions i i've seen enough to say that uh, yeah at least Sometimes it's not that wild to think, and there are some kind of case reports out there of folks where, it, you know, again, you don't really know what was going through the person's head, but it seemed pretty credible that that was probably what was going on. Like this person thought they could fly. And again, that's very atypical. That's very, you know, that's very rare. Probably more common are people, you know, just wandering into traffic, not looking where they're going. Um, I remember one horrible case from years, gosh, about probably eight years ago now of some 19 year old, I think wanted to take the biggest dose of psilocybin he'd ever taken. He ended up in a neighbor's house. He was just out of it, just totally out of it. And the police came and they, they killed him. Um, and he was like 120 pound, 19 year old, but you know, he's just, 
he's out of it. You know, he's um, acting like a wild person and breaking into someone's house. And um, um, I think it was certainly an overreaction in the details of that case. But nonetheless, it's it's situ again rare, but it does happen, and it shouldn't surprise anyone that knows enough about these compounds. I mean, they're. I mean, they really alter someone's sense of, of, of reality. So the bad trip can happens in about a third of people. Do you feel like you can identify that ahead of time? You could just Can you, based off of how people talk about themselves and their past experiences, and if you're doing some kind of survey where you're finding out how they feel about the world around them? Well, like if a bad trip can happen to anybody, then is there something about that day in particular or like what they ate for breakfast or yeah, is, is it any pre- predictive markers mm-hmm. for that? Nothing that's good. I, I mean, so on the first question, it's like, can you identify the person? It's like, yeah, there's some evidence that um, uh, at personality, the personality domain of neuroticism is is more predictive of having a difficult experience. Um, but and also some evidence that be, that being in it, not surprisingly, that being in a a a uh, an experimental setting, and we could think of kind of real world analogs to this but like say you know being in an fmri you know with, with all the horrible sounds and everything <laughs> and, um it, it yeah. people have worse experience more difficult experiences in psychedelic research and and similar with um a lot of testing you know being poked and prodded and questionnaires throughout um and so you know presumably similar in the in the in the real world so to speak when you know someone is is uh you know kind of in a chaotic situation where disturbing you know stimuli you know going on about that they're going to be more likely to have a difficult experience but the thing is none of these particularly at the personality level none of these things are that um you might be able to pick up on a correlation if you analyze several hundred people but in terms of your ability to say aha this person i mean i wouldn't I wouldn't exclude anyone from a a, a psychedelic therapeutic trial because they were high on neuroticism alone. Like that might actually be the domain where they're going to see the most benefit. Yeah. I was going to say some part of this is actually overcoming that, those feelings, right? Like it seems like having a bad trip, quote unquote, isn't necessarily a bad thing if it leads to you facing some internal demons and conquering them, whether it's like fear of death with terminal illness or smoking something like that like it might be a bad experience you might have to see yourself in this mirror and be like well i don't really like what i see right so that's why i like to use the word challenging with the participants for you know because the bad thing is if you did something to hurt yourself it might be really really difficult or challenging and most people do say that those challenging experiences were something that they learned from that they deeply valued and it could take many forms as exactly as as you alluded to michael i mean it's it's um now it, it, this is a difficult thing to convey because like i you know we do our best to minimize those challenging ex- experiences so to make make the person as comfortable as possible to develop that rapport with their guides as much as possible to you know to reassure them nonetheless it will still show up in a, at a high dose at about in about a third of people and under those conditions a whole lot of most people not everyone will say that that was an integral part of how they learn that of what they learn. I mean, it could take many forms. Like sometimes it takes the form of catharsis in the sense of um, exposing yourself to the thing. I mean, gosh, I think of our work with cancer patients where, you know, subjectively, you know, it wasn't uncommon for someone to just subjectively die during the session and, and even outside of that work, certainly. But you know, and destruction is like, let it happen. Just observe it. Try to be non-judgmental. If you see your body dissolving, like, let it dissolve, you know, these types of instructions. And to go through that, you know, mm. it's like if you're being eaten by insects, let yourself be devoured. <laughs> you know, sort of the, this wow. idea of like, okay, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you? And then you step out of it and then it it actually happens in your experience while your body is being kept safe. And then you kind of go through it and you hold on to these instructions and you move out through the other side. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have said in the context of the smoking cessation research that, um, oh my word, if I can, if I can go through that, like they'll say, I just went through the 
to the end of existence and through to the through the void and there was nothing and like the whole idea about like you know bugging out over you know a cigarette for a couple of minutes is just absurd you know they'll just have this reframing it's like yeah i can yeah i can put up with a few minutes of cigarette craving you know whatever um and and sometimes it's just you know People takes the form of people you know, looking at their demons. They they can you know face up to the um, things that they regret from their past um, relationships, very difficult relationship dynamics, and just I mean sometimes people get stuck on well not stuck but they really find themselves dwelling on the, you know it's really just the dark side of humanity. I mean just you know the world is I mean you can look at it as like an absolutely hellish place. I mean, just the level of suffering is just absolutely un, you know, and predation and how could people be so evil? Yeah. How could nature be so ugly? You know, how could, how could, you know, little, you know, babies die of disease, you know, and sometimes people like just feel this kind of sorrow for all of this. And just like, I got days like that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Just, and it's, there seems to be something cathartic about that too. It's like, it's not like any kind of answer came. It's not that any, you know, something that they could tell you necessarily sh shook out of it, but just this process of kind of totally surrendering to that and moving through it. Like, like an integration. Yeah. And sometimes there's lessons of like, well, that, that, you know, it's like, okay, in spite of that, the beauty and the love and the truth, despite that backdrop, not, you know, like specifically because of it, that's, that's what defines reality and so you know people can pull together these philosophical lessons that makes more sense to me why psilocybin would be effective in helping people conquer something like cigarettes because i was listening to you I've, I've read the research i was listening to you say it and it seemed perplexing to me but i think that a substance that teaches you to live with sorrow and pain and to be able to bear it is a substance that will give you discipline in a weird way. Where it's a substance where you, because discipline hurts to do something. You do a lot of this behavioral economics research where you're looking to see how people will delay a reward. And the ability to basically say, I will delay the reward or I can reframe the reward for myself, I think comes from suffering. The toughest people I know are the people that have gone through war or starvation or conflict or something truly, truly difficult and landscape reforming. And then in mm -hmm. the aftermath, obviously, there's all kinds of traumas and things like that. But in people who manage to get through all of that, in the aftermath, there does remain this iron core. And I wonder if that isn't partially what's being influenced here. Yeah, I think it's I think that's uh, that's right. There's something like that that's going on here in many cases where. Um, yeah, people are sort of like are they're faced with their you know, all these things that they would like to uh, uh, avoid um, otherwise, but this sort of shines the light in the basement, so to speak, and not knocks out the cobwebs. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it really, se you know, it does seem like this ability to kind of put up with the, to tolerate um, distress seems to be a, a factor that's going on here seems like it has like some parallels to you know cold therapy like this which is really popular right now too this idea that if you you subject yourself to something really difficult in the morning like an ice bath then like you know taking out the garbage later is not going to be that big of a deal or like making that phone call you didn't really want to have to make or whatever it is are there differences in long-term efficacy based off of good trip versus bad trip like, does it help you to have a long-term effect if you have a bad trip that you that you or a, a challenging experience? That's not really clear yet. Um, it certainly seems clear that it doesn't hurt, at least in this setting. You know, like, you know, in in kind of some survey research I've done, right? Not surprisingly, like sometimes a bad trip leads to like prolonged suffering, um, and and thankfully it appears that you know in the field that what we're doing is is protecting against that because we don't really see you know evidence of that with these sort of safeguards 
there, but yeah, certainly. I have a question about the guides versus, uh, well, about the guiding experience in general, because this is something that I've seen come up a few times is that often people that I talk to have the most beneficial uh, psychedelic experiences completely alone. Mm. And, and that's a difficult thing to study, I imagine. Um, and then to that other, uh, another level would, would be, what if the, are the guides intoxicated themselves, right? Is it beneficial to have somebody who's stone cold sober in the room or does it not matter at all? Does uh, somebody have to be these, driving the bus? Yeah. Are these questions uh-huh. that you, that you think about or? Yeah, I think, yeah, certainly think about these questions. Uh, the, the, there's multiple, you know, there's scientific questions and then there's sort of like, you know, political, you know, pragmatic questions. I mean, kind of with the latter, I think that just, you know, kind of um, the guides and, you know, taking the substance in the same session is just not going to fly. I mean, it's, it's not going <laughs> to, it's, you know, the FDA. Alarm bells will go off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, this is, you know, but I also think, I mean, I understand the, you know, the, the kind of case, you know, I think for that, you know, the person is in, you know, they might be more attuned. This is sort of the argument, but. But this seems like something that would benefit from service, right? Where it's, if you're going and you're looking at a ritualistic setting where the guide is taking the substance as well, maybe that setting isn't inside the laboratory. Maybe that setting is somewhere in, you know, an ayahuasca cave in Peru. I don't know if they do it in caves, but do you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think that there, there's, yeah, there, there's enough problems that can, you know, come from, from this. And particularly as we're trying to mainstream this stuff into, you know, in, into the practice of clinical psychology and medicine in our society, you know, just the, the, the guy taking the substance with the participant just um it, it it seems like it just is fraught full of uh you know you know pitfalls you know um it's like not professional gonna... enough or something like that it's not it, it's just too open to to things going sideways and nobody being around to correct it and yeah yeah and I think kind of one of the lessons from the sixties is that, you know, this shouldn't be about the researchers experiences. It should be about the participants experiences. And I, you know, and the other kind of side to things is I, I want to see the data. Like, is it really true that someone, you know, and people with, you know, all kinds of things have been done. One of the kind of things done in the underground and in some of the older research was, you know, taking a half dose, you know, the guide would take a half dose and, I kind of want to see data like does that really like is that person really better prepared to empathize with people it's not like you need drugs to empathize with people um you know or 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 are they going to be more distracted in their own process like i don't really know if i wouldn't be at all surprised if the person was a worse guide i don't know that to be the case but that's a very plausible outcome i think we need to check ourselves there's a whole lot of sort of like i i don't know um received wisdom that i don't know in this field where folks will think it's heresy if you do things one way or the other if you differ from what's traditionally been done and i i think that can be that can be dangerous um i think we've got to question everything including like yeah like i don't know a good argument to is to be made of like having someone who's 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 you know who's prepared with you who's really caring for you who cares for you as a human being and is attentive to you is paying attention, which doesn't, you know, these aren't drugs that make you pay attention better. Like, I mean, you can find that and maybe you can find a way in which depending on how you define it, it does. But again, that like they might be, you know, paying attention to their own process rather than what's happening, you know, with the patient in front of them. So they seem like really important things to sort out as it moves into the commercial realm or into the therapeutic realm. Like where we live in Oregon, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it's moved into the medical uh, phase of legislation. Like it's been approved for medical studies, at least uh, psilocybin has. I think in January that comes into it, they've been in the a two-year okay. kind of figuring it out process. But I, I think I could be wrong, but I believe it's coming up soon within a few months when 
it's going to be in practice. Yeah. So what, we, what is that going to look like? Do you see this moving towards something that's very, like you said, mainstreamify something, or I forget how you put it, but are you going to see this where I can just go, is this going to be through hospitals exclusively, or is it going to be, I can go somewhere and have a psychedelic experience that's guided and something like a talk therapy session, or what, what's, the, what's that going to look like in the future? Yeah, it's going to p- depend on the setting. So the thing in Oregon that may not that may not look the same um, as FDA approved use um, that would come with medical approval of one or more of these psychedelics. So I think we're still waiting. I'm I'm not up on the latest um, in terms of how that's playing out. Like what this is going to look like. I'm not sure whether the Oregon whether that's good. It, whether that system is going to allow for the treatment of disorders. That was one of the concerns I remember like, that I had. And like, just one of the questions, it's like, well, does this span both the treatment of d- medical disorders and just, you know, spiritual exploration, et cetera? Because if in the former category, well, then that kind of runs up against things like the state regulates the practice of medicine. And then you've our people, our physicians going to lose their licenses if they get involved with this, all of this stuff that, it's just kind of a nuts and bolts, like how is this going to be integrated? Um, so I'm not quite sure how it's going to look. I mean, I know it may have changed, but one of my concerns initially was that there was no um, educational requirement for the um, for the guides. Um, um, and I believe at least, and this may have evolved since because it's been a process, but, you know, at least before the, the legislation, the bill was passed in referendum that... Um, the argument was that, well, indigenous healers may not, um, you know, they shouldn't be held to, you know, like, you know, the same credentialed, uh, you know, degree systems and whatnot. Um, but, you know, this is, you know, <laughs> you know, well, it just seems like it's, 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 it's a place where there can be a lot of things that can go wrong and you want to make sure that you're not because you're doing screening and you're looking to find the people that are hanging onto reality by a thread are you going to create a situation by making it easier to access in therapeutic settings where a lot more people's threads to reality are getting snapped because i can see that as being a distinct risk because we talked about this jerk is going to ruin it for the rest of us too right it's like somebody is going to be predatory and just take advantage of people and yeah we're always talking about ways in which we could expand the way that we offer stuff to the world where we do the podcasts but we're also really interested in psychedelics and these spiritual experiences and so we're living we're living in a state where it's becoming legal and so we toyed with the idea of okay well what would that look like? And then almost immediately, my first thought is you're going to break people and you're going to break mm. people frequently and terribly if you're not careful about this, because it's a substance that I mean, I think that any substance, even drinking can can change a person in a way that is really, really not good. Like if you run a bar, you're going to have bar fights, you know, like it's just going <laughs> to yeah, happen. Right? If you run a psilocybin clinic, you know, you're going to have people bug out. Right. It's good. And I think we forget about this, but, um, you know, if you're familiar with the Good Friday study, the 62, 1962 study by Walter Pankey and Tim Leary was his advisor, but this was done in, in the, in the basement of a chapel, Martin Luther King Jr.'s mentor, um, very produ- you know, uh, provocative speaker, much like MLK himself was was speaking upstairs in Marsh Chapel in in, in the Boston, um, uh, Massachusetts area, and uh, and and not one but two of the of the participants on psilocybin, and this was kind of the first study that showed that mis- psilocybin induced powerful mystical experiences, like people get having this sense of unity and timelessness and spacelessness and, and ineffability, but not one, but two people escaped from that research setting. One of them, he was listening to the sermon. They, so these people were like loaded up on psilocybin. Some had a placebo, like a, a um, I believe it was, it was niacin in, in that trial. So not a very good one, but, but it became very, pretty clear who was on the placebo and who wasn't because they were all interacting with each other. But these people in the basement of this chapel and like hearing this sermon on a good Friday, um, you know, it's a very provocative sermon. And these were all seminary students, I should say. So it wasn't like, like from some, you know, uh, 
you know, faith that they were alien to. And, and, and one of them became so inspired is like the sermon, you know, the pastor was saying, you've got to you tell the world about the man on the cross. And he, and this participant thought, yeah, like, I'm, and he's like, how do I start? He's like, I need to find the president of Harvard. I need to tell the president of Harvard about the man. And so he was like, they had to chase him down the streets of Cambridge. <laughs> they had to t- tackle him and inject him with Thorazine. <laughs> right down the street, you know. So this stuff and this um the optics guy, not great, not great on that. Not great. And and um <laughs> in the era of work, cell phone cell phone video? Yeah, before cell phones, yeah, that wouldn't have been that wouldn't have played out well um <laughs> with psychedelics, you know, in the era of cell phones. Rick Strassman did this research with um DMT and psilocybin. He never published his psilocybin research, but he had someone, an experienced psychedelic user that escaped from the lab and and was you know called his 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 partner during the during the session and she came and he left he was on a high dose of psilocybin and you know thankfully everything was the person ended up being fine but you know you don't have to go that far back i mean that was in the 1990s i think if you read kind of about how he conducted some of his trials, it may not be too surprising that people kind of got bugged out. I mean, it was very kind of medicalized and, um, you know, had the sanitized feel. I remember from his book, like someone was, uh, his experience. I mean, this is very extreme, but we're talking about psychedelics in his experience. He was being, um, anally raped by a reptilian alien. Oh no. And, And I mean, the participants had, anal thermometers in them during the experience oh my God. don't ask me why that's like the way you want to do this but anyway don't be too surprised if one of the experiences yeah, is some... absolutely wow like yeah, yeah like well that, that is so... happening <laughs> yeah so yeah so we you know i think we just have to be like very uh aware that these are risks like people kind of like bugging out leaving the lab but then like probably even harder to appreciate is just i mean there's going to be cult leaders who So, you know, who don't see themselves as such, but that are going to develop into such. I mean, don't underestimate what a strong personality can do. And I've just gotten worried just watching researchers, which in in the scheme of things are relatively mild mannered in, in, in the scheme of things. But it can go to people's heads. You know, this is it. It can hard. It can the gravity of being associated with these experiences which can often not always but often be described as one of the most meaningful important experiences of someone's life i mean that's a huge head trip um to deal with you know no substance involved you know but that's a trip in itself to be you know even associated with that process and you know participants you know falling in love with their therapist and 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 therapists kind of like filling in the blanks. This really kind of concerns me. It's like filling in the blanks on the metaphysical questions about the nature of these experiences, where I feel very strongly that we just, you know, you bring people seem to be led to a great mystery and whatever the, that mystery is, whatever their interpretation, we just need to let them drive the bus. As far as that goes, you know, is this is an experience of God? Does God exist? Is this, an exploration of other dimensions is this you know just a random monkey wrench in the nervous system i mean i can tell people what you know type of serotonin receptor is activated in the brain i can cite the trends from research findings in terms of behavioral changes we might expect on these big questions i don't know like the if the participant has an experience their opinion on those questions is as valid as any anybody on the planet and I think there's a real danger in sort of like kind of this kind of Pied Piper sort of, um, you know, kind of having this, uh, you know, again, particularly with charismatic people, this kind of cult like following. I mean, the most extreme example is probably Charles Manson, who who clearly was using LSD to brainwash his followers into this, you know, and part of that was this to, to murder people as part of this like really you know, insane kind of race war kind of ideology. I mean, just as extreme as evil and as bizarre as one could imagine. Um, And there is some indication though, that Charles Manson wasn't acting on his own, right? Or at least was like under the watchful eye of people who would love to see LSD impugned as a 
of the CIA. Yeah. So I mean, Tom O'Neill had a good book about that recently. Yeah, the chaos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read that. I, I think that's a great book, and I think it's, you know, and and as he struggled with, and the reason he obsessed with this over decades, and never wanted to publish the article or then the book is because he didn't have a definitive answer. But I have to say, it's up there. It's like probably more likely than not that CIA was a part of or, or, you know, being monitored. And, you know, the CIA was, you know, it seems pretty credible that, you know, in there and it would fit completely with their efforts that they were um, may have been sit- sitting back watching you know, like, oh, let's see how this guy, this guy is super charismatic. Like, can he, what can he get his followers to do? Like, can this solidify? Because they this kind of, of failed to to use it as the desire and mind control substance that it was intended to be. And it seems like at least part of that has to be because of the set and setting wasn't right. You have to have people that are willingly able to collect behind some incisive figure in order to be able to have the sort of, you know, brainwashing that they were hoping for. Yeah, it may only work in a subtype of individuals that are particularly, you know, um, open, too open, you know, vulnerable um, people. It, 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 it may require that charismatic figure. And we also don't know, like, there is a lot of information that came out from when those documents were declassified and a lot of them ended up in um, Acid Dreams, which is really the the definitive account that book um, uh, based on those uh, declassified papers, but a whole lot, like a whole lot of records were like just disappeared. And I think in the book chaos, he goes over this as, as well. Like, and even uh, in the stuff that was put out, like there's a whole lot, you know, pages with mostly black. On That's the problem with investigating anything by the CIA though. It's like, it's almost bound by definition to be a circumstantial argument because they're a, an organization that destroys records so it's like what do you right what do you where are you at? you're never going to find a smoking gun for anything really right and, and would they be past making up a record no <laughs> you know, there's spies of, here's the scent that way i mean no, they don't do that yeah, here they don't do that domestically <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. (laughs) They're totally an external organization only meant to destabilize vulnerable Latin American countries that get in the way of trade deals. What's what's really interesting is one of the most, I think the most deadly cult that I'm aware of, I think of all time, is Jim Jones. And Jim was not giving his followers drugs, but he was on a tremendous amount of uh, dopaminergic drugs, actually, and not psychedelics at all. And he was just like tripping out of his mind at the end because... Uh, some of these drugs that are not even psychedelics, like methamphetamines in high doses, leads to, uh, you know, no, oh, yeah. I don't know what you call it, sleep loss. And sleep loss right. can be a hallucinogen by itself. Absolutely. And that's yeah. kind of fascinating to me that that gets sort of swept under the rug. Just the, the, the hallucinogenic potential of some of these other drugs that we don't even really associate as psychedelics. Yeah, it's a good point. One of the the... In fact, um, most most drug classes make people hallucinate at high enough doses. But for most drugs, those doses are so high that they're physically dangerous. So amphetamine psychosis, exactly like at very high doses, like, man, these are these have very, I mean, beyond psychedelic effects. I mean, just. Yeah, I mean, completely. I mean, and they, you know, probably better mimic the you know acute phases of paranoid schizophrenia than the psychedelics do but they're actually at such high doses that are very toxic um um yeah that's it's not to be underestimated like high dose amphetamine psychosis especially with methamphetamine when you it's so long acting and next thing you know you've just you haven't slept in five days and just things just spiral out of control why do you think that this sort of leads into why why do people historically treat psychedelics with this at least state let's say state level organizations treat it with such uh skepticism is that because while there's... giving amphetamines to children right yeah yeah right? is it just because there's no obvious immediate therapeutic use of it and therefore since we don't understand it and some people have positive results some people have negative results yeah, I th- I think it's largely the cultural associations with the '60s. I mean, it's sort of the backdrop is a, that of a, a 
of something that's not to be taken seriously. Like here goes a bunch of crazy young people that just just want to act crazy and do weird things and like dance around, get naked, like whatever, be a buffoon. I mean, I think this is kind of the the kind of the impression that's left for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, even more so than other. I mean, I, I think I think it really scared. I think the psychedelics into a similarly cannabis, you know, but, you know, back in the late sixties, it was really LSD. That was the, I mean, when Jimi Hendrix, Hendrix, the song, you know, are you experienced? I mean, he, he wasn't talking about cannabis. He was talking about LSD. That was like the, that was the, and it wasn't psilocybin back. It was back in the day. Um, that was by and large, what was going around. It was LSD and high doses of LSD. And it were just really scared. I mean, I think folks really thought that that was what was, had played a big role in this kind of worldwide countercultural movement. Um, it's just you know, a destabilizing force or something that, that has the potential to undermine everything we've believed in up to this point or something like that. Right. It's like your kids are going to like forget about college, forget about like them ever like having a job. Mm -hmm. just college like they're just you know they're going to be bums and they're going to be like begging people for food and uh, yeah i think that's the impression that was you know kind of created you know for for better or worse and do you um, think that lsd is more dangerous than psilocybin no i i don't think there's any evidence of that um the 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 nature of the dangers could be a little like so in one, I mean, there's nuances here. So psilocybin, LSD is going to have about twice the duration of drug effects. So in some sense, per use, to the degree that part of the risk is doing something stupid while you're high, you know, you just if you're not being watched out for you, you wander into traffic or do something, you know, like like I talked about earlier. Yeah, the chances of that are higher if you're on something for 12 hours versus six hours. But I mean. The, these substances are more, I mean, in every meaningful way, they're more alike than they are different. Um, and, and, you know, you get into things like, well, LSD is synthetic. There's some risk of, uh, well, let's see, 20 years ago, if you were sold something called LSD and it was on a little piece of blotter paper, you were almost guaranteed that was definitely LSD because there was a, there's very few things that can fit onto a piece of blotter paper where you can only fit at most a few hundred micrograms, like a fraction of one milligram of substance of mass on it. There's very few things you can put on there that are going to be potent enough to have that effect. These days, there's all kinds of exotic phenethylamine uh, compounds like 25 n bone that can fit onto blotter paper that are much more dangerous. Like you could take 10 times the amount of LSD you were intending to and it's not going to kill you it, again if you don't you know fall out of a height or something you know but if you manage to get through it don't have any accident you know you'll have some crazy story to tell maybe but it's not going to kill you now these other substances like that's a uh, you know that's not necessarily the case like most substances like caffeine and like alcohol and like most things you buy over the counter you take 10 times the amount you know that's the recommended dose and yeah you might die don't be surprised if you die i mean uh, so, you know, people are, who are used to LSD, they might gobble up, take 10 hits of this other stuff and they get in trouble that way. That said though, mushrooms, you know, you can, um, if you're picking them naturally, you can, there's, there's a, a number of, uh, other mushrooms that look similar to psilocybin that are, that are poisonous, that are actually poison, not, not make you trip poisonous, but like they kill you poisonous, you know? So, you know, there's nuances, but. By and large, these are just very – it's it's like the distinction between Xanax and Ativan or Valium. I mean, those are all benzodiazepines. One might be longer acting than the other, shorter acting. You know, one's dose is like, well, you got to take 2 milligrams rather than 10 milligrams or whatever. But once you get the sufficient dose in the system, there's way more in common than there are differences between them. And if you ask people anecdotally, it's just interesting that – yeah, some people say, like. Oh, I could eat all the mushrooms I want. Someone might say, but LSD, oh my God, it bugs me out in this particular way. But, you know, you have to talk to the next person, they'll say the exact opposite. And I think they're all telling the truth. You know, it's like, you know, some people say, hey, ibuprofen doesn't work for their headaches. Aspirin does. Like, can't drink tequila, but they're fine with gin. Right, right. And, you know, 
some of that could be placebo, but yeah, they're very, they're very well could be a truth to some of these claims. You mentioned uh, salvia earlier, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. something quite the opposite, right? It's very short experience. Uh, does that make it easier to study in a sense? Because people come right back from this extremely far out mindset and, and you can annotate it. I mean, yeah, yeah I'm curious about those studies. Yeah, Do you give so them some drug easier. to to potentiate it? Is there some way you can draw it out longer? Or? So I haven't done that. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the the interest in studying it in that form actually was vaporized, which is essentially the same thing as smoked, but it was to like, you know, that's the way the vast majority of people are using salvia divinorum. So if we want to understand what the kids are doing, you know, we want to understand this route of administration. I've also known folks that it's far less common, but to try to, you know, take it for more um, uh, psychological exploration or for even potential therapeutic effects, people will develop tinctures and which will have a more prolonged effect. And I do think there's more potential there. I mean, sort of the smoked salvia experience is sort of, you know, like a smoked, you know, DMT or 5-methoxy DMT experience. Some people can pull meaning out of it, but it's just, it's way more challenging your typical person who's not a well-experienced psychonaut, um, I mean, they tend to come out of it with just their mouth open, like, like, (laughs) what the hell is that? You know, just, it's so far beyond it. And it's hard to place it so far out there that it's hard to kind of, it seems like the meaning can be made when you have at least like one foot in reality and one foot kind of out there, maybe like an oral psilocybin or LSD experience where you know, someone can have contemplations about their childhood and about their life circumstances. And it seems like know, people are doing that with DMT just... in the most <laughs> right, exactly. But it seems like people have found a way traditionally to extend those experiences such that they can. I mean, the whole goal of a lot of these psychonauts is to bring something back, right? Or even in the mm-hmm. therapeutic sense, you want to gain something productive or have this change within your motivational structures. And so, a lot of a lot of the efficacy or the positive outcomes comes down to prolonging that experience. Um, yeah. I know that they they don't just do these quick 10 second trips in traditional cultures. They mix together some sort of, uh, I don't know the pharmacology of it, but they, they prolong the experience. Well, exactly. So ayahuasca can actually refer to any number of, sometimes referred to as yage, often ayahuasca, but, um, a number of plant combinations, but always involving at least some, you know, a plant source of tryptamine such as DMT and another source uh, containing uh, compounds that inhibit the monoamine oxidase system. So in other words, the, the enzymes that normally would make it so that DMT, you can't swallow. If you swallow just a pill of DMT, it's not going to have any effect Mm. um, because your, your gut's going to immediately metabolize it into something that's inactive and so what ayahuasca has, ayahuasca is in part DMT, but it's combined with other compounds that temporarily knock down your MAO inhibition system so that it will temporarily allow uh, a, a DMT to, to, to go through your system and eventually reach the brain before it's gobbled up and deactivated. So and that's, and that's a very salient example of exactly this. So something like if you smoke DMT, which again, it wouldn't work by itself if you swallowed it, but you can smoke it, you know, but that's a 15 minute experience. But ayahuasca is more of a three hour experience um, because it's combined with something else that allows it to be orally absorbed and has a longer effect. And I think most people will say it, you know, again, there's exceptions, but most people would probably say if you're looking to have a, a therapeutic effect, probably ayahuasca is the way to go rather than, you know, just, smoked dmt Hmm. is there like a normal physiological condition under which the human mind could experience dmt is there some some i think that one of your papers was measuring naturally occurring levels of dmt so i haven't i haven't done any work there has been some 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 work to try to figure out like those levels of of natural of endogenous dmt we do know it is it is well established that the um uh, the brain the pituitary produce 
DMT. So it is an endogenous compound. What's debatable is whether it shows up in at enough at a high enough dose essentially <laughs> within your system if those levels are high enough to have any psychoactive effect. And we don't really know because it it we know that if you take a blood like not much is showing up in the blood at any random time. Um but we you know science has never waited around someone's entire lifetime until they have that one naturally occurring, you know, like say near death experience or maybe an alien abduction experience or it's been speculated that a lot of these kind of really extraordinary human experiences may be related to an endogenous sort of release of DMT. So we don't really know. Do, um, is it possible that the DM, you know, endogenous DMT levels are surging during those experiences? It's it's plausible. Or like oh, other no. transformative events, like the death of a spouse or like some great achievement, you know, where people have really changed their mindset about something. I just, I wonder to what extent, is it a myth? I've heard it said mm -hmm. before that DMT is like released when you die. Is that a complete myth or is that an unsubstantiated factor? You know, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't looked, I, I believe there is some research that has looked into this and I don't know it well enough to to say whether there's something to that or not. Wishful I thinking. Be yeah, I, I just don't know. Yeah, I want to claim um, ignorance on, on that one. I don't want to say it doesn't happen, though. So psilocybin is metabolized oddly inside of the body. It, From what I've read, it ends up, it interacts with the adrenal glands in some strange way. Is that the case, or did I misread? In terms of its its metabolism, I'm I'm I don't think I'm, I'm asking sure. the question yeah. correctly. Oh, like okay. I remember just pharmacology, in general? just pharmacology, maybe in general. I remember reading a study where they, you know, as scientists do, they gave a bunch of my psilocybin and then dissected them to find where the psilocybin was showing up, and they found it in the okay. brain and they found it in the adrenal glands. Not much in the brain. Okay, though. and not much in the brain. I think mostly in the adrenal glands. If I if I remember. Oh, correctly. interesting. So yeah, I'm not sure why it would accumulate there. That's interesting. Okay, so because I I was never we've we've this was like an had, old like, study from the seventies. It has some serotonin effects, but in terms of do you know do you know about where it actually binds at and and how that like what is you know let's say I eat a mushroom, what exactly is happening inside of my body from like a mechanical standpoint, the molecules and so it 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 metabolizes to psilocin in the in the gut. So that's a very similar molecule, but phosphoryl group is cleaved off. And then it uh, is, uh, you know, slowly absorbed into the into the blood system, the circulatory system. It, it's able to cross the blood brain barrier. So it's able to get into the brain. And then, it, you know, it, the serotonin 2A receptor system is where it hits, which is really widely distributed in the in the cortex. So the newer part of the brain, um, it's uh, uh, they tend to be on like layer five pyramidal neurons they they tend to be in positions that play um a computationally heavy hmm. role like like in a they're well poised to play a modulatory role mm -hmm. which is why i think that you know a whole lot of this interest in psychedelic work is hopefully going to lead to a, a better understanding of the role of the the serotonin 2a system because we really don't know much about what these these receptors are there to do mm. and it could be that they're they are it could be that they're playing this kind of very kind of meta level modulation of our sense of reality it could be that in those kind of life-changing situations that you were mentioning that they're that that there's some sort of effect on these receptors i mean it, it it's striking that at certain times like it with certain events, people will report derealizations, and at other times, that things like on a psychedelic are they seem to be in a hyper reality where things almost seem more real than everyday life. I I wonder whether there's this sort of uh, um, kind of modulation of that, and I wonder in like human evolution, is that is that kind of tied to like group? Um, ecstatic exercises, you know, these various ways that human beings for thousands of years have 
sort of tried to create cohesion mm. within the tribe, you know, chanting. Yeah, that dancing. really gets at like what is reality on a fundamental level in terms of it's not necessarily everything that's happening around us. It's where we pay our attention to, to some extent. And even as a group, what we pay attention to, like a schizophrenic person might be paying it like you said they might be paying attention to these different paranoias like oh i'm in this theater full of people like they're probably all out to get me but somebody which isn't irrational necessarily like it's very possible they all are out, out to get you but there, there's something about building this shared reality that's very important to, to being a functioning healthy individual where you're integrated into this social structure that's almost more real than the the myriad possibilities of physical reality and, and there must be some neural structures to fine tune that uh, it's just such an important piece of being a human being. Right, right. I, that makes a lot of sense to me. Because I think about like, you know, those evolutionary pressures. It's like, we've just been such an, an incredibly social animals and, and just in countless situations where, you know, a bunch of people have had to, you know, throw themselves in the front of the group, whether it's the the neighboring, you know, tribe attacking or whether it's, you know, I, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, hunting, you know, hunting prey that very well might take you out, but you're doing it for the rest of your, you know, you're doing it for the family and the tribe and everything. And just, I mean, you, you kind of think about these situations, like what would humans be if it wasn't like, like at this level of, of transcend transcendence of the self, it can sound very, you know, it's obviously very kind of, um, philosophically interesting and it, you know, but, but it might be very pragmatically interesting, like literally, like, can you get outside of your own self's way to like your whole tribe is going to be wiped out unless you jump to the front of the, of the, whatever, the line of people that are defending the village or a mother for her baby or and, yeah, exactly. Or, or, or the yeah, elders yeah. for the young, I don't know, just there's millions of, of ways you could imagine. Right. It That's being... probably a better example. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, these incredible circumstances where self-sacrifice is, is, is is needed um and those are just you know there's so many of those with humans i mean probably more so than other species and but you do see it out there like in animals in general if you take a walk in the woods it's wild just you know ants are a great example or bees or actually honeybees are a great example right they sting something that's it for them um right. and so it seems like there's something inherent about that uh that, that that must be psychologically built into something as psychologically complex as a human being where where you must there must be some trigger that allows you to see something bigger than yourself otherwise it'd be perfectly we'd be perfectly capable of rationalizing oh well i'm in charge of me i do my thing and that's really all that matters i mean that's a you could people come to that conclusion all the time um right so it makes sense that there'd be like a control frame that sits on top of that in some sense um, right. And maybe like other like like insects are kind of hardwired. Like it, bees are interesting because I believe they're um uh they share something like don't quote me on the details. I think they share something crazy. Like their their genetics are crazy. I think like they share something like s the siblings in the in the hive will share like 75% of their genetics, not 50. Like it's just like it's this, very high, yeah. Especially the females. And, and so yeah. And so all of a sudden, like when you get into group selection games, that's like that's really a game changer in terms of and and yeah, like watching ants form bridges and all. I'm not sure about their genetics, but I I, I, I think about this stuff big picture and it may be that. You know, humans like all of these traits that the other animals will be hardwired to do, we tend to take a modulatory role, like instead of covering ourselves with thick fur, it's like, well, Sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. Let's just get rid of the fur and I could put this stuff on when I'm when I'm cold and I could take it off when, you know, when I'm warm. So in the same way, like maybe we don't always need to have group cohesion. Sometimes there might be a downside. Sometimes we don't want to be kind of lemmings, you know, but so maybe there are ways to, you know, even without psychedelics, like maybe sort of, you know, you know, chanting and group, you know, and, and I mean, maybe that's the origin of music itself, mm. you know, is this, you know, it perhaps involving the serotonin two way system, you know, um, but the crickets you know, certainly think so. times, the crickets, the, the crickets seem to believe that there's something uh, fundamentally important about music. I mean, there's, there's other the animals, we walk around, we live way out in the country and 
just some nights it's just an unbelievable symphony out there it's just crazy just listening to all the bugs and animals yeah uh in concert and in yeah. harmony oftentimes um when I first was rotating in labs, there was a, a lab I looked really carefully at that uh, someone had just put together that these frogs were communicating in actual intervals with one another. So they were singing legit harmony structures with one another. And somebody who, uh, a grad student who happened to also have a music background just noticed, she was like, whoa, I think that's a perfect fourth. And like she looked into it and it, <laughs> it was true. And so, you know, I, I think that music is extremely fundamental, oh, wow. um, especially among social, you know, especially it's even fundamental to like the, the orbit of the planets and stuff. But it's fundamental, especially and, and seems to be really important in group cohesion and in all species, in all social species to some extent. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. This was Darcy Kelly's lab, I think. So I have a, a little bit of of a of a pivot. You mentioned singing and dancing and chanting and this fundamentalness of these interactions. Do you think that there's a reason for the decline in cults that has to do with the decline in psychedelics? Are cults has there declining? been a decline in cults? <laughs> Actually, I'm not. Has there been? <laughs> I feel like cults are more popular than ever. I don't know. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I, I belong to three or four myself. <laughs> <laughs> my my feeling is that there is uh, to the level of Heaven's Gate and the Rajneeshis and the yeah. the I mean, Waco's Town, exactly, yeah. exactly. So. I yeah, the feel... 80s and 90s were chock full of them. I don't know whether it's just, yeah. <laughs> well, I think people forget yeah. that uh, there's this incredible uh, podcast, if you ever get a chance, it's called uh, Martyr Made with Daryl Cooper. And he did this huh. really long, like, I want to say it was like 20 hours long about Jonestown. And what people often misunderstand about it is that Jim Jones was actually really well respected by the communities that his church was a part of originally. Like it wasn't like, oh, there's this dangerous cult out there, right? It started to go sort of sideways at the end and he got really paranoid and they moved down to uh, South America and that's when everything that's famous unfolded. But it was looked at as this really, you know, at least from the outside, from people who didn't really, he, he very well shielded the reality of the situation from the outside. But people essentially thought it was an upstanding community organization for the most part. So are you implying that we're surrounded by upstanding community I'm organizations that are out, like a yeah. step or two away from Jonestown? Yeah, like what is a cult, right? Like how, how do you, you know, it's not necessarily so obvious until 700 people drink the Kool-Aid in the jungle that something has gone sideways. So yeah, I don't know if cults are disappearing or not. Okay. I mean, I... From where I'm sitting, I look out onto the world and it feels like there is... Certainly religion seems, at least in this country, seems to be less interesting than ever before. It, it, yeah. it, there seems to be less guruism that is centered on some kind of psychedelic or some kind of altered experience use. It doesn't, it seems more isolated, okay. but it does seem like there's there's fewer very Less large groups where I, no one that I know lives next door to a cult which is poisoning the restaurants in the three towns over you know right right, right. I guess maybe we just don't know I, I'm willing yeah. to I'm willing to entertain the fact that we don't know that's interesting I certainly hope that's the that's the case <laughs> and um and I don't know whether I mean one of my fears is that the, like yeah psychedelics are just gonna that I mean, don't get me wrong. I think we need to push forward with the development of psychedelics in, in a number of ways, but we have to be aware of the of the potential downsides. And um, you know, my assumption is that these are you know going to increase. You know, these types of uh, you know cults, you know, surrounding you know psychedelic use. Um, but yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, one of the things to keep in mind is that you know, the, the sociologists don't make a distinction between religions and cults, you know, it's that, that's sort of more of this like kind of uh, judgment valence that just, I don't know, like <laughs> the cults are the religions that we personally think are wacky <laughs> and dangerous, but, but someone else might, you know, Richard Dawkins might say like, they're all dangerous and wacky. What do you mean? <laughs> like, the, the, you know, like, um, so yeah, yeah. Are the you know part of this? You know, are there going to be more threads of mainstream religions that? And of course, a lot of these so-called cults have been threads of more mainstream religions that have broken off. But you know, are is there going to be more psychedelic 
sacramental use within kind of Christianity and other mainstream religions. I mean, I think in part that that's probably going to happen, at least on the edges. Mm. Yeah, that'd be a very different kind of communion, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, in a sense, the I mean, gosh, all I mean, three um, uh, religions that have um, permission to use psychic psychedelics legally in the u.s are all nominally christian religions the native american church the santo daime and the udv um all are sort of you can consider syncretic you know combined you know indigenous elements but with a you know that main stream of uh you know christian doctrine so it it's kind of already here you know i i really hope that we can as a society find a way to make the most of these substances as we move into accepting them for their therapeutic potential because we we often have this same this problem and where we're, somebody ruins it for everybody you know or, or some bad practitioner lets people get away with this that and somebody runs out in front of a train and then everybody's like well this is done that was a nice experiment or the charles manson thing happens right where somebody you know, it gives LSD a bad name for the next 30 years or whatever, or mm -hmm. cannabis or whatever it is. So, yeah, yeah I really appreciate uh, the work you're doing because I think that the only way that we can avoid those negative outcomes is by better understanding the consequences and what happens as a result uh, of taking these in a controlled setting. Mm. So, and thank you. And you're working on this project right now, which is carrying out a more controlled study of the effect of psilocybin on quitting cigarettes. But where do you, so assuming that that goes well and everything works out, where do you go from there? Do you have, do you have a larger, longer plan or is it that you pick it up as it goes? Oh, there's all kinds of things. Uh, I mean, I kind of want to continue exploring you know, like therapeutics. I've got some work lined up to examine psilocybin and the treatment of PTSD um, some, yeah, I, I also have some plans to, to see if it can help with opioid addiction. And so I think in the big picture, kind of theoretically seeing if connecting the dots with these disorders that psilocybin seems to be able to treat, like, I think we can learn about a lot about what are the commonalities amongst these disorders that we're not normally aware of. And, 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 and so in that sense, psychedelics might be you know, one of the tools whereby we can start to um, appreciate the transdiagnostic underpinnings of these supposedly distinct disorders. I think there's probably a lot more in common between, you know, say, you know, different forms of addiction and depression um, than we we normally appreciate. I mean, why is psilocybin seeming to work for all of these these things? I mean. Um, so I think that's critical. I think there's um, all kinds of questions about, you know, even outside of therapeutics, um, related to 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 um, you know to consciousness, to to you know, to, you know to self identity that we can learn um, about uh, with psychedelics as tools. Um, so I think that it's you know psychedelics and in the, in the eventually are going to be just one. I think one very powerful technology, but like with, you know, brain stimulation, um, other, you know, maybe as, as it evolves, the, yeah, um, you know, TMS, like magnetic uh, stimulation, the, these methods of like radically altering the nervous system and, and then maybe in combination, I mean, you know, a hundred years, 500 years from now, it just, it's hard to imagine, you know, if we're still around that we, it's just unimaginable like where we're going to go with these technologies in terms of like, I mean, we're going to be able to orchestrate, you know, brain states probably on the floor of, of whatever type and magnitude that, you know, it's like we just can't even wrap our heads around right now. Like kind of this, like we're probably in our infancy in terms of like, there's this correlation between this, like the activity of this hunk of meat, you know, this brain <laughs> And these subjective experiences, and it's, you know, one of the world's, the universe's greatest mysteries is like, what is that connection? You know, the hard problem of consciousness, how could we, why is there any experience that unfolds through this you know, activity and this biological, like material system? 
so in the, in the biggest sense, I, I, I really think these things can be tools to start to, to hack away at that, at that problem and determine like how, how, how do physical states somehow result in, or even the word language here is difficult because we don't even know what's primary. Is it the, the state or the, or the material system, you know, cause even even by saying that the, the state is generated by the brain is you know making an assumption but just to understand like what that you know you know how complex can that get how you know can we you know uh you know can we orchestrate uh you know a a a mental state of of any type you know can someone you know, live a lifetime as another person if we are able to program that into their nervous system. You know, just like kind of and what incredible that. responsibility that come that comes along with that, right? I mean, if once we yeah. hopefully we don't achieve that ability before we know what to do with it on some some level. Yeah, yeah, and we when we probably just will, imagining Facebook the developing this technology, <laughs> oh, <God>. right? <laughs> right? Saying. Yeah, it could sell you yeah. anything. Just just make the desire happen in your head. Yeah. I mean, yeah. these are these are fascinating questions. We've we've recently opened this investigation into consciousness and psychedelics, and I think that the interplay between altering your consciousness and studying what comes out of that alteration is the most exciting area for me because it seems like it it's breaking it in creative ways. It's stress testing it. It's looking mm-hmm. at the things that we can normally see and then going just beyond them in order to kind of turn around and look back on what's actually happening. Right, that's a great way to put it. And so I, I'm, I'd be thrilled to talk to you again a little ways down the line to see how things are unfolding because this is really paradigm shifting work that you're doing, and oh, it's yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to chat again. Yes. Yeah,